Good, good. Uh, before, before he walks down, we got to acknowledge uh, our drummer, Lance Chabot, who's telling me no. Fire on the rim, mountain bike race yesterday. How, you don't even know what I'm going to say. Uh, how, how, many, how many people, how many racers competed? Okay, 300 total, 75 in his, in his heat, but Lance Chabot, first place, fire on the rim. So congrats, Lance. Uh, I, uh, you guys can thank me because I chose not to compete so that he could have the win. So uh, I don't know why that's funny. Hey, turn in, turn in your Bibles to the book of Psalms. We're going to be in this uh, book for quite a while, so you might want to find out where it is in your Bible. Uh, if you don't know where it is, it's in mine, it's like right in the middle there. Uh, Psalms is in the Old Testament, and hopefully by the time we're done today, you'll have a better understanding of what the book is about. But we're going to start off this morning uh, in Psalm 3. Psalm 3. Uh, so if you, if you get to the Proverbs, you've gone too far, I'll give you a little bit of time to get there. Ezra, Nehemiah, Esther, Job uh, is right before Psalms. So Psalms 3 is where we're going to find ourselves this morning. I'll read the passage and then we'll pray. It says this, Psalm 3, a psalm of David when he fled from Absalom, his son. Verse 1, O Lord, how many are my foes? Many are rising against me. Many are saying of my soul, there is no salvation for him in God, Selah. By the way, when you read through the Psalms and you see a word like Selah, there's something, it's, a, it's kind of an unknown musical notation. It could have meant pause or rest or a changing of people who sing or a changing of instruments. We're not really sure, but it's uh, some kind of a shift. Verse 3, but you, O Lord, are a shield about me, my glory and the lifter of my head. I cried aloud to the Lord, and he answered me from his holy hill, Selah. I lay down and slept. I woke again, for the Lord sustained me. I will not be afraid of many thousands of people who have set themselves against me all around. Arise, O Lord. Save me, O my God. For you strike all my enemies on the cheek. You break the teeth of the wicked. Salvation belongs to the Lord. Your blessing be on your people, Selah. Pray with me, if you would. God, as we begin this new series today, uh, I'm really excited because I think that uh, collectively as a group of people, as a church, that, that at the conclusion of the series, how we interact with you is going to be different than before we started it. And I believe it's going to be healthy for us. It's going to be pleasing to you. And so uniquely as we start the series, I pray that our hearts and our minds collectively would be attentive and listening to what it is that you would have to say to us uniquely through your word, through these psalms, through this series. And we pray that in Jesus' name, amen. So Dave briefly mentioned it before, by the way. Great job, guys, playing, playing Help by the Beatles, that rendition, that was cool. Uh, yeah, you can clap for them, but uh, there's some, or not, okay. Uh, <laughs> there, there's something, and you know this to be true, there's something unique about songs, Songs and singing have, have a unique impact or effect on our entire being. Does anybody ever hear a song come on the radio and it instantly brings you back to a time and a place and, you, and you're there again or it evokes emotions? I remember when I was in uh, seventh grade memorizing uh, the words of a song to a girl that I hoped one day I would be able to sing and I never got that chance. Uh, I know that's sad, isn't it? But I, but I did, because songs, that's something about songs. They can, they can bring back memories. They produce profound feelings. Songs, they express ideas and maybe even sentiments. I could try to communicate to you a thought, and you would go, I really don't get it. But you put it to a song, and all of a sudden you get it. There's something very unique about this thing that we call songs and singing. In fact, I could do this. You ready? Some of you don't have rhythm. 
Come on, you guys aren't helping me out at all. Okay, you ready? We will, we will rock you. Anybody ever be, be, you're at a game and the game's not going very well and somebody's like, music guy, put the song on. We got to rally the troops here. Why, they, why do they do that? It affects emotions. It connects with us. And even the thing that we're experiencing can be completely irrelevant to the, maybe the purpose or the intent of the song, but, it, but it, all of a sudden you connect. It's a connection. It's emotional. I could do this for you. Ready? Sweet Caroline. See? That's just how songs are. And we can sing that song and all of a sudden we just want to stand up and grab our neighbor's hand and love each other. That's the power of songs. They, it doesn't matter what the emotion is. It could be joy, it could be sorrow, it could be sadness, it could be fear, it could be pain. Songs are really good at connecting with those emotions. Some times in our lives, we all have pain. We all have sorrow. But if we are wise, we know that there's Always tomorrow. We love it. Yeah. <laughs> it, do you see how evocative songs are? They, God wants them to have a very unique position in our lives with him. Why is it that? Think about this. Every single Sunday, some of you have been going to a church for a long time, and you've never thought about it. You just got used to it. It's kind of strange that every single Sunday a group of people get together, and for half of the time together, what are we doing? We're singing. Why is that? There's a reason for that. Songs, songs are something that God uniquely wove into the fabric of creation as a way of us relating to him and relating to each other. There's power in songs. And, and what we're going to find this morning, it shouldn't be surprising then that the book of Psalms which is really a collection of songs. It's 150 songs. It should not surprise us that this book expresses all of those emotions. Uh, if you read through Psalms, you're going to find some of them that are, that are just amazed at who God is, and that's very appropriate. Some of them are songs that, that talk about sorrow over sin, and we're going to look at that in a few weeks. There's songs that are about desperation and fear and anger and depression and thankfulness and gratitude, whatever it is that is consistent with the human condition, you're going to find it expressed in the Psalms. And sometimes the emotions are intense and they're raw. Uh, sometimes so much it makes us uncomfortable. When you read through the Psalms, there's going to be times where you go, whoa, is that, is that allowed to be in there? Anybody have that feeling this morning? Remember verse 7? Let me read it for you. Did anybody squirm when I read this? For you strike all my enemies on the cheek. You break the teeth of the wicked. Ow. <laughs> that's, that's a little extreme, isn't it? What we're going to find all throughout the Psalms are these various emotions expressed in a very real way. Here, I, I was reading uh, in studying for the series, and somebody said it really well, and I wanted to read what, what one of the commentators said about these kinds of statements in the book of Psalms. Uh, he said this, the passages on which we may be tempted to sit in judgment, pause there, so we, you, you read that, break the teeth of the wicked, how could he say that? So we're tempted to sit in judgment. The passages on which we may be tempted to sit in judgment have the shocking immediacy of a scream. Ah! What happens when I scream? Everybody goes, whoa. You, you stop and you listen. If you're in the store and you hear a scream, people go, whoa, what is that? Or if you're at home and everything's quiet and you hear a scream, you go, what's going on? These, these passages in the Psalms are intended to be, as this commentator says, it's like a scream that causes us to pause. What does he say? Uh, to, be, to startle us into feeling something of the desperation which produced them. And so when you read through the Psalms and you read something, you go, whoa! It's, it's intended to, to be a shock to where you go, wow, something's going on here that's pretty intense. And so when David writes, God 
uh, smack somebody in the, in the cheek and break their teeth, the intention should be we go, hold on, something serious is happening here. It's exactly what they're uh, intended to do. The reality is life is raw. Life is intense. Life is uh, worthy of these very real scream moments. And here's what I love about the Psalms. The Psalms give us a very unique approach to emotions. We're going to see it all throughout the series. Every, every single one of you here today is an emotional creature. Every single one of you here today uh, feels emotions. However, the way we, we respond or express those emotions are very, very different. Some of you in the room are on one end of the spectrum, and you feel things that are intensely emotional. It's not that you don't feel them, but your response to those emotions is to stuff it. You, you, you contain it, you hold it in, and nobody would ever know what you're feeling. Now, on the other end of the spectrum, when people feel emotional things, you, you, couldn't, co- you couldn't hold it in if you tried to. You couldn't contain it if you had to. And when you experience emotions, you just go, blah, this is what I'm feeling. The Psalms give us a very unique approach to how we respond to life that is emotional. And instead of just stuffing it and not expressing it, or instead of expressing it in kind of an unbridled, unfiltered way, the Psalms shows us a different path where it says, okay, whatever you're feeling, don't pretend like you're not feeling it. That's not good, because you are. Don't pretend like you're not feeling it. Don't just also vent without any purpose. Instead, do this. Whatever you're feeling, make it an expression from your heart to the heart of God. Instead of stuffing it and pretending like it's not there, instead of just without purpose venting it, take those emotions that you're feeling, those deeply intense, raw emotions, and express them to God and let him process those emotions with you. That's exactly what we're seeing in Psalm 3. Uh, uh, What's happening with David? Let's go back to our passage. Uh, Psalm 3. It says this, here's the title before verse 1, a psalm of David when he fled from Absalom, his son. So here's a little background. King King David, he's a king of the Old Testament. He led uh, a group of people called the Israelites, the Jewish race. And David was a guy who loved God a bunch, but he also had a lot of problems. And uh, he's got several sons. His third son, who happens to be his favorite son, is a guy named Absalom. Here's what you need to know about Absalom. Absalom is handsome, he's charming, he's charismatic. Everybody likes Absalom. Now, Absalom, as happens a lot of times when you're good-looking and charismatic and charming, uh, a lot of people like him, and he likes that a lot of people like him. It kind of goes to his head a little bit. And so Absalom knows that his dad is king, and he starts to think, boy, these people really like me. Maybe, maybe instead of me just having people that hang out with me and like me, if I was king, then everybody would like me, and my position would be one where I would get the the glory and the honor that I think I deserve. And so Absalom, David's very own flesh and blood, his son, begins to uh, turn people against his dad. And he wants to be king, and so the only way he can be king is if his father David is dead. And so he basically puts into motion, uh, puts into motion a, a means for his dad being killed, so he can be king. No surprise to David, David would prefer not to be killed. And so instead of hanging out and waiting to die, he runs. He flees for his life into the wilderness. Absalom over time has influenced so many people to where the scales have tipped. And instead of David standing his ground in this moment, in this time, he has to just run. He has to flee. Absalom then says, hey, my dad's fleeing. Let's gather the armies. We're going to chase after him, hunt him down, and kill him. Bummer. Right? And so so David is hiding out somewhere in the wilderness. There's, there's some mountainous terrain, and there's rocky crags, and David, and, a, and I don't know how many people, but they're hiding out. 
and they're just waiting. They're looking into the distance, and they're watching for dust, and they, they're sleeping with one eye open. And he's, he's agonizing over his, his emotional state. And so he basically starts by just acknowledging to God what's happening. By the way, if you're looking for maybe a, a very tangible way for you to express your emotions to, to God, what David did, his, he just started by acknowledging this is reality. This is what's happening. Even though God knows it, he says this is what's happening. Verse 1, O Lord, how many are my foes? Many are rising against me. Many are saying of my soul, there is no salvation for him in God. Let's talk a little bit about what's going on here. David, it says, doesn't have just a few foes. And it's easily lost in the translation of that word many. But the word literally, when it says many, it, it refers to something that's gathering steam. Something that's growing. Something that's increasing. And so when David says many are my foes, what he means is there's a bunch of them. And that bunch is growing by the day. There's a very large group of people that have turned against him. Remember, this is the guy who's king. This is the guy who, who cares for his kingdom and for his people. But they're turning against him, and the number of people that are turning against him is increasing. And they're not just a threat to his physical life. They're a threat to his entire person. They're, they're attacking his identity and his calling and his character. That's why that phrase is in there. They're saying there's no salvation for him and God. Let's give you a little background. Remember, David is a guy who one, one time in a moment of weakness saw a, a beautiful woman. And even though he was married, said, I think I would like to be physically intimate with that beautiful woman. And he was. And things spiraled out of control. And it wasn't like that was a hidden sin. People knew about it. And so probably what's happening is Absalom is saying, hey, as he's, as he's having conversations with people, maybe having some coffee or having... Uh, you know, going for a walk. Hey, you remember what that, you remember what David, you remember what my dad did with Bathsheba? You know what God has done? Because he did that, God has removed his favor from him. And so he has conversations and there's murmurings and those murmurings grow and those murmurings increase. Hey, do you remember that one time where D David, I know he's king. He, you know what, my dad, he's supposed to be an example to you. But do you really think that's a good example for what a king should do? Maybe to his, his family members. Man, dad really, really blew it with that. You know what happens when people blow it? God, God removes his favor from him, and God's not going to bless, you know, as long as you follow David as king, God's not going to bless you, or he's not going to bless our kingdom. Maybe there should be a different king. Absalom isn't standing on the street corner proclaiming. He's having all of these strange little uh, conversations with innuendo and maybe saying things directly, maybe not. But what he's doing is he's attacking the character of his father. And legitimately slow. He did, make, he did sin with Bathsheba. But now all of these people are talking and David has to wrestle with this truth that th the underlying accusation is this. As he's hiding out in the wilderness, the thing that he's believing is what I've done is so bad, God has abandoned me. That's what people are saying. And he's, he's wrestling with whether or not it's true. The thing that I've done, God, you understand my, and now all these people are saying these things, and, and he's already feeling regret for the, for the sin, but now it seems like the consequences are heaping on, and, and you know this, it's one thing to be attacked physically, it's another thing to be attacked emotionally. Has anybody ever had anybody say anything bad about you? That's fun, right? Sometimes it's true. Sometimes it's not true. But... Sometimes, if I gave you the choice, would you rather experience physical harm, like somebody literally just beat you up, or have a bunch of people talking and saying really horrible things about you? A lot of times, people would say, I'll take the physical harm. Anybody with me on that one? Yeah. So he's experiencing both. His, his life is in danger, but also he's aware that this growing group of people are believing things about him, and and his identity is being questioned, and he's, he's, he's wrestling with, well, who, who am I? Uh, am? Are all these things true? And so after acknowledging the reality of the situation, his song takes a new direction. So the first thing that I would encourage you to do is, 
instead of stuffing or instead of just pointlessly venting, go to God and just, and when we say songs, I'm not saying you got to sing a song. It can be a prayer. Some of you can't sing. I know that. Some of you can't put something to music. That's okay. But what you can do is just express your heart. You can pray. And whatever situation is that you find yourself in, you can start by just acknowledging, God, this is what's going on. This is how I'm feeling. Every single one of us can do that. But then his song takes a new direction. He's saying, I feel this way, and this is the second important part. I feel this way, but this is what I know the truth to be. This is how I'm feeling, but the second part of his song is, even though I feel this way, this is what I know to be true. Let's read it again. But you, O oh Lord, key word, but. But, this is, what I, this is the situation, but you, O oh Lord, are a shield about me, my glory, and the lifter of my head. And so what he's saying is, God, even though I am literally being chased down by armies, you are putting up a shield all around me. And that army may be big, and it may be growing, and they may be mighty, but you, O oh Lord, are my shield. You're stronger than that army. You're mightier that, than that army. And yeah, they're coming against me and they have their weapons, but I believe you, God, have put shields all around me. And even though they may be strong, you are stronger and I have your protection. I know that, that you're protecting me. And because you're protecting me, then that should change how I feel. It's a great acknowledgement of truth. You, O oh Lord, are a shield about me. My glory and the lifter of my head. What does that mean? What that means is there's all these people who are saying cruel and hurtful things about him. Some of which are true. Some of which are not. But, but the, the narrative that he's hearing is these are reminders of his mistakes and his failures. And so discouragement is setting in and depression is setting in. But he says, God, you are my glory. What does that mean? He's saying this. Here's what glory, when you read that word glory in the Bible, what it means is this. It means significance. It means identity. It means my, what he's saying is this. My confidence, my identity as a person doesn't come from, it doesn't come from what people think about me. My significance, my glory comes from what you think about me. You are my glory. The opinion about me that matters most is your opinion of me. All of these people are saying things about who I am as a person and my identity. But you, I'm going to choose God. I'm going to allow you to be my glory. What matters most is what you say about me. And this is, I know the series is called, uh, we were talking about this this past week with our staff. The title of the series is Songs of the Soul. And David, uh, David, our worship uh, pastor, we, we had wrestled with whether or not to call the series Songs of the Soul or Songs for the Soul. We ultimately ended with Songs of the Soul. But David said, you know what, maybe we should have called the series Songs for the Soul. And I thought, you know what, they're, they're both good. Why is that? Because as David sings a song of his soul, it becomes a song for his soul. It was the exact song. He expresses a song to God, and somehow in that song, it becomes something that's for him. God, it's, I am not who people say I am. I am who you say I am. It's a song for his soul. I love this phrase, the lifter of my head. So what's happening is this. It, I don't know how many of you ever seen, we, ha, we have a, a physiological response to our emotions. Sometimes we as adults, we're really good at hiding it, faking it, right? But kids don't do as good hiding it. Have you ever seen a kid that was really sad or feeling down on themselves? What do they do? Literally, their head is down. Why is that? It's because, it's because something has happened in their life where they feel bad or they feel discouraged or they feel despondent. And so literally heads go down. David, hiding in the wilderness, fleeing for his life, 
God, you know what's going on. Many are rising against me. But I choose to remember that you're my shield. You're my glory. My significance comes from you. I, my identity is in who you say that I am, not in who other people say that I am. And when he, when he begins to embrace that truth, what does he say? God, you are the lifter of my head. He's saying, God, when I, when I remember who you say that I am, I can walk around and there can be literal threats to my life. And people, my own flesh and blood, my son who I love is trying to kill me. And people in my kingdom, people that are close to me, they're saying these things. But as I believe you to be true and how you feel about me, somehow those things fall by the wayside and you lift my head high. You're my glory. You, you are the lifter of my head. And so instead of dejection, I just imagine David running into the wilderness and his head is down and he's despondent. And he has this time where he just breaks away and he just, he, he, doesn't, he doesn't stuff it. He doesn't vent it, but he expresses it to God. And then God in the midst of that song works. And he reminds him of important truths. And as he processes and as there's this song that comes back for his soul, he, he understands, God, I have your approval and your honor. And if, if I know and if I can remember that you're proud of me and that you love me and that you care for me, I can hold my head high. Here's, here's what I know to be true about most of you in the room because you're human. This is not an easy thing. But I, I know a couple things to be true. One, most of you are going through something that's intensely raw and emotional. Sometimes we walk into a church and we're, hi, good morning, reach around and greet somebody. Hey, buddy, how are you? But then there's, there's something intensely painful happening in our life. We're wrestling with something could be like with our family or a job situation or a financial situation or our health or somebody that we know or somebody that we don't know. Who knows? Can we just acknowledge that most of us in this room right now are hurting somehow in some way? Can this be a safe place and say that's true? Is that true? Okay. Did, did, if you think you're alone, did, can you hear that right now? Can we acknowledge that most of us in, in the room are in some way hurting or going through something deeply emotional? Can we acknowledge that again? You're not alone. And so the question is, what do we do with that? That's the question. What do we do with it? It's not whether or not we're going th through something. The question is, what do we do with it? My encouragement for you today, and when I prayed, I said that I hoped, and I believe this with all my heart, I hope that people... 10 years from now, we'll look back at this moment or maybe this series and say, the way that I went through difficulties and hard times completely changed. My whole life, I used to just stuff it and pretend like it wasn't, you know, don't feel it, don't say it, pretend like it's not there. But I stopped doing that. I started, instead of stuffing it and just trying not to even acknowledge it, I started expressing it to God. I equally hope that there's people who 10 years from now say, you know what, when I, when I experienced emotional situations, I would just blah all over the place and everybody knew how I felt, but it never helped anything. But we went through this series in Psalms and I, and I saw how people went through very raw, intense emotional things and they started by expressing those emotions to God and allowing God to work through them and to shape uh, how, they, how I thought about my situation and what I was going through. And I'm far more, it's not that I don't experience the emotional stuff still. But I shifted and now I allow God to use the pain and the emotion and the rawness and the intensity of life to redirect me to who he is. And there's a greater peace and there's a greater uh, comfort that comes from that. Um, I want to pray, the band's going to come up and they're going to close us briefly with the song. But before I pray, I want to read for you the end of the verse, the passage, Psalm 3, 5 through 7. I love this. Verse 5, 
This is the response to all of that. So he expresses the emotion. There's a knowledge that comes. And the result, here's what happens in David's life. He says, I lay down and slept. <laughs> don't, don't underestimate the power of that. I laid down and slept. Anybody ever lay down and not sleep? Okay. That's what he's saying. I, I not only laid down, I slept. How was he able to sleep? I woke again. The Lord sustained me. So I will not be afraid of many thousands of people who have set themselves against me all around. The reality, here's the thing. The reality of the situation has not changed in any way. Is there still an army bearing down on him? Absolutely. Are people still talking crap about him? Absolutely. The reality of the situation hasn't changed, but his perspective has. And so now, because his perspective has changed, he's able to go, okay, I'm going to lay down and I'm going to sleep well at night. And I'm, and I'm not going to be afraid. Arise, O Lord, and save me. God, you're the one that's in control of the situation. God, you're the one that's, that knows far more than I do, and I'm putting my trust in you. So my encouragement for you this morning as we uh, close in prayer, matter of fact, would you just quietly in your heart pray along with me? And let me ask you, what's happening in your life today that's causing you to lower your head? What's causing you to lose sleep? What's causing you anguish? I, I would encourage you sometime this week to turn your situation into a song. And when I say song, you don't have to sing it. You might just pray it. But sometime this week, have, have a moment where you're able to honestly and sincerely express to God how you feel. bear it all get it all out there give it to God and listen for him to sing a song back to you and reveal to you truth tell him what you're feeling allow that song for him to reveal himself how he feels about you and so father I pray for each and every one of us in this room that that as we navigate through this book of Psalms that we would be encouraged to to emulate and to adopt the strategy for how to deal with the emotions of life. We recognize that, that even the ability that we have to communicate with you is because of the work of Jesus, who just like David cried out, felt abandoned and felt afraid. We thank you that, that our ability to come to you and pray to you is, was made possible through his work. I pray for a long-lasting, permanent shift in how we deal with difficult times as we increasingly learn how to sing songs to you. Do a, do a work in our lives even in the days to come. We pray that in Jesus' name.